for the invitation. Uh, it'll start in a minute. Yeah. Okay, today we have uh, Dr. Felix Caputo from uh, the Congo, and uh, he is right now a visiting professor at Fordham University. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about African literature, his own experience as a writer, as a teacher, a scholar, and an activist. Welcome, Felix. Yeah, thank you so much, Phil, for this invitation and for meeting after 40 years. Yes. Somehow. Yeah. The question I was, um, you sent me was, uh, if I could talk about African writers who have influenced me, my work, experiences as teacher and traveler. Then uh, I changed that into this topic, which is inspirations, amplifications, African writers teaching, traveling from home to the world. Then uh, feel free to interrupt me and uh, raise questions at any moment you want. Uh, my talk is subdivided in uh, um, six, seven different um, subtopics with an introduction, a background, what I've called amplification, African literature and writers, English literature and the world experience, then a short conclusion. Um, as an introduction, I'm from the Congo, as Phil uh, said. I was born in the city of Lubumbashi, where he was as a Peace Corps volunteer. That's where I was born. And uh, that's where, for the first time, I got some taste of literature, oral literature, and some other kinds of uh, entertainment. At the time, Phil knew me. I wasn't named Felix Caputo. I was named Ulombe uh, Caputo. That's how he was calling me in class. Because at that time, the president of the Congo, Mobutu, had asked everybody to drop the Christian name we had received baptism. So I was called Ulombe Caputo. But later on, I was happy to recuperate my name and once again to be called Felix, Felix Caputo, Felix Ulombe Caputo. In my background, as far as entertainment is concerned, I count my father and my uncle. I grew up in a boarding, a, in a Salesian boarding school, but whenever I had the chance to go back home, I would sit by him and uh, would follow his talk, talks with his friends. And he had that capacity to carry them in the places he had visited, the places he had gone to during the weekends, or sometimes for longer. And then uh, his friends were listening to him, looking at him and admiring him. And I was there, I couldn't talk, I couldn't ask a question, I couldn't get in the conversation because I was only a son beside fathers. The second uh, figure of that time is an uncle who was a hunter. He was living in a village far from the city. Whenever I visited him, he used to take me at night and see and go with him around to see how he was hunting and how he was shooting games, but also how he was lost in the bush. For me, he was lost, but he, he was never lost. At a given time, I was surprised we were back home. So from him, I started learning how to guide myself in the wilderness and to find back my way. In addition to that, he was so specific uh, during daytime. He was silent. But whenever we came across a plant, a tree that could serve medicinal purposes, he will show it to me and will insist 
My nephew, remember, you can use these leaves, you can use the roots, you can use the bucks of the tree for such or such purpose. It is with that background that finally I got in high school, in the Salesian boarding school. And while I was there, I had the opportunity to learn most of the most famous Roman writers and their writings. I can mention Ovid and Metaphosis, Salust and uh, um, uh, his writings, um, Virgil, Tacitus, Claudius, Josephus, Apian, and Cicero. Cicero, with whom we were taught the art to talk, the art to attract the audience attention in his insistence in what he was calling captatio benevolentai. And then with the others, I learned how to, to make historical records, how to, to, make a, to write a biography. However, even though I learned a lot from them and also from uh, um, Greek writers uh, that we had in class, I didn't have that opportunity to have a teacher who could put me in these writings, in this text, to leave them, to, to be part of the text. I miss that very much. And that, that's what, in my background, I could achieve in the first year I got at university. And thanks to you, Phil, because you made a big difference in your teaching. And uh, Latin was maybe what is called a dead uh, lingua, a dead language. Uh, English is a living language. But all the same, I was surprised to meet a very young man who was able to carry me, and then in what I'm calling amplification, to carry me in the text we're learning. We had already learned some English uh, in high school, but not much. We were already introduced to some English literature, but not much. We had learned a lot of French literature. So that was the first time I had in front of me a young teacher who would speak in a way that a non-native would understand, follow him, uh, get with him in the text, um, sometimes imitating the characters uh, the most important characters of the text. With him, I was able to, to learn how to share knowledge, how to captivate the attention of the audience, how to use simple didactic material to communicate in simplicity, how to use a simple blackboard with a, a white chalk to use randomly for some uh, words of vocabulary or for drawing something. With him, I learned how to look at each, it, each student as an individual and uh, believe in the potential he was presenting and how to give time for revision, even though I, I must confess he didn't like very much um, getting revisions because that would uh, uh, waste much time. So my colleagues and me, at least two of my colleagues, we decided to start writing very interesting questions that would uh, um, attract his attention and therefore he will spend time answering them and in that way will revise the material. With him, I learned the, the use of a journal in class for writing paragraphs, 
S's, correcting them in class with others, and communicating differ differences that students could have in their writings. With him, I also learned that student, uh, that a teacher could stand up for four hours talking, teaching. Indeed, in those time at the University of Lumbashi, we had for each class two hours, but they could be extended to four. And we had often four hours with a short break of about 20 minutes. And during all that time, he was up talking with gestures showing and uh, with us had the opportunity to learn much of Shakespeare comedy, much ado about nothing, or the Merchant of Venice, history, King George, but mostly tragedies, Hamlet, Julius Caesar, King Lear, Macbeth, Othello, Romet and Juliet. I can still remember very well having in class Macbeth and uh, spending time in understanding how Lady Macbeth had blood on her hands. I can still remember the explanation I got from him from how the bush, the forest was moving to, towards the castle and how these images were vivid, how I got into to class and from there learned the ways in which myself would later on be conducting uh, my own classes. We learned poetry, turning around sonnets by Shakespeare, but we also went to other English writers like William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor, Bercy Shelley, Lord Byron, John Keats and others. As we had him during two years, during the second year, we uh, very much focused, focused on American literature and the chance to, to learn the, um, uh, Walt Whitman, and I can still remember some of the verses. I believe in you, my soul. The other I am must not abase itself to you, and you must not be a best to the other. As you can see, I can still uh, remember them and recite them because the power that that young teach that young teacher Ed could could drive me in the text could make me understand what uh, what man was writing. We learn. We uh, also discussed among the books we had Ernest Hemingway's "The Sun Also Rises." and the others. It is the first time I learned about the Ophicandos uh, facing the danger, etc., which I learned that time. We could also spend some time on learning William Faulkner, John Stenbeck, Nathaniel Orphan, Henry James, Richard Wright, uh, um, Henry David Thoreau, Mayor Angelou and Langston, Langston Hughes. So we had the chance to discover already at that time that uh, there was um, African-American literature also that was interesting. And in fact, years after, I was interested in the poetry by Mayor, Mayor Angelou. Uh, what I would like to, to, to point out and insist on at this level is the fact that I didn't go straight to African literature, learning it and understanding it. That may look, that may seem strange uh, to those who be listening to me, um, because everybody will take for granted that born in Africa, growing up in the Congo, the first literature I would have studied would be African literature. No, I studied Latin, Roman uh, literature. I studied Greek literature. Then uh, I didn't yet have my inspiration as such, 
which became true at the time I reached the first year and the second year at the University of Lubumbashi. And that, as I, pointed, as I have pointed out earlier, thanks to a very young teacher of the Peace Corps. I don't know if there is any question at this level. I, I think it's fascinating, Felix, to what you're saying about the fact that it's, it's ironic that here you studied Latin literature, Greek literature, English literature, American literature, before you actually were introduced to African literature. That's, that's kind of an anomaly. What, what do you make of that? Um, that has to do with the programs the way uh, they are set. But at the same time, I can understand as far as at least uh, written material is concerned. Because uh, remember, um, uh, for instance, when we take novels, novel is not an African genre per se. Hmm. So it came to Africa through colonization and um, the first writers tried to adapt the African way of conversation, of communication to get into the writing. So in that way, I could understand. But at the same time, I had some uh, background of oral, uh, oral narratives, oral literature, which also was taught somehow during the, the same year, the same first year and the second year at university. So, uh, uh, that make it, made it easy to move to see how a writer can move from oral material to written material. And by the way, that is also a universal experience because all over the world, um, the, uh, the writing process came later on, but earlier people used to communicate orally and uh, it's only later on that they could fix by writing um, the material. With that, let me uh, now move to African literature. With that background, which um, made me understand how entertainment was working, how writing could be consistent, how a play was working, a tragedy, a tragedy was working, a poem could be, a sonnet could be written, with that, I went back to, I went then to African li literature and then had the joy to discover uh, people such as Thomas Mofolo and uh, Amos Tutuola, who were among the first, uh, the first African writers whose writings uh, still reflect much of oral narratives. I was happy when I was in Brazil uh, last year's to have a student who was writing ESP, a PhD uh, using um, Amos Tutola writings, then uh, Amampate, Amadou Ampate from the, the, the French tradition, and Mia Kuto from the Portuguese tradition to show how, in fact, uh, uh, African traditions, African writings have covered the oral narratives as we can see them in Amos Tutola and uh, Thomas Mofolo, but how uh, they're, they're still influencing writers uh, either in the French uh, former colonies, uh, Portuguese of, or English. And as we can discover the writing of Amadou Ampate or Mia Kuto, and then we have a transition to the post-colonial time discussing things related to power, etc. After these writers, then I went on very quickly, testing uh, a writer like Ezekiel Mfalele, whom later on I will compare with Ole Soinka, one mentioning a lion and how the lion behave, and uh, Soinka behave uh, mentioning a tiger, but both saying that when, when there is a prey, um, a tiger or lion jumps on it, and uh, eats it, doesn't discuss, doesn't get uh, in discussion with it. So in a way of saying that when there is 
some discussion or equation, we don't need spending much time in um, discussing without in endlessly discussing, but go straight to the material. Then um, it was with joy also that I could read Alan Patton, who started um, leading me to the history and uh, uh, in South Africa, um, in the same way Peter Abrams and his writings that uh, shows life um, in South Africa, essentially in Johannesburg, in the mines, and uh, how um, um, racial uh, controversies were present there. And from there, I went on reading Chino Achebe, whom I had the chance to meet while I was here uh, in the past in the United States and then discuss his writings. And then Ngugi Wathiongo from uh, Kenya uh, or, and Buchi Emecheta from Nigeria, uh, with whom I learned much about gender um, in African countries and uh, whom, to whom I have already have always opposed gender uh, as it is in my communities, which is so much different from what she described. Then uh, back to South Africa with Nadim Godimer for understanding not only um, um, life in South Africa, but also some more techniques of writings, um, how, how a writer can carry um, his audience into the writing, which, which is fiction, but at the same time, the, micro, the microcosm there um, um, reflecting daily reality, the history of Africa, and calling for attention for the readers and everybody to, to participate in what could be, uh, could lead to a change. So, and uh, we've, we've heard then back again to Kenya with Major Mangi, uh, who wrote a play entitled uh, Kill Me Quick, uh, showing how, in fact, the failures uh, coming after the independences, African had believed that with the independence, they will be happy, they will uh, forever be the leaders of their own countries, but they were still um, suffering. In the same veins, uh, like Titsi Ndangaramba from Zimbabwe, uh, she is um, pointing out uh, psychological conditions, or again, Maria Maba, a uh, Francophone writer from Senegal, uh, mentioning um, female conditions in Muslim countries, in African Muslim countries, um, and so on. Then again, reading like uh, Farah um, uh, from uh, from uh, the eastern part of the uh, of Africa, for understanding how, how different trends of African writings were happening. And uh, yeah, then there are some new younger writers like uh, Ngozi Adishe and the writings that, that uh, helped me to write an article that shows the evolution of the African writing and thoughts from Amos to, to uh, I mean from Chino Achebe, who was very much relying on the oral tradition to uh, Ngozi who is in between Nigeria and the United States, and therefore opening Africa to um, the global level. I think I will stop here for a minute if there is another question before I move to the following section. Um, I, I'm so interested in the fact that, I mean, you really are connecting your experience as a young boy listening to the elders to the, your experience as a reader and as a, a writer and, and, and scholar, uh, and it's the thread of the oral tradition that holds that together. And it's interesting because, of course, you began with the oral tradition and, and then rediscovered it in a way through these works uh, by internationally known writers like Amos Tatwala, Jinoa Achebe, Woli Shuenka, uh, Nguji Wathiang, all of whom really work out of that tradition. So it's a, it's a fascinating um, journey, a literary journey, uh, Felix. Yes, indeed. 
Yes, indeed. And I can uh, just to, to, to add something which I will take, I will put on, I will put a straight on later on. In fact, by uh, saying earlier that uh, I had learned much of literature from other countries, I need to underline also the fact that I didn't know much about African traditions as such, because I was born in a city, even though small, but it was a city that was disconnected from uh, uh, oral traditions as such and the Afri African traditions as such. It is later on, when I left the US in uh, 19, I mean in 2012, went to Belgium for writing um, another PhD that I decided to focus on um, cultural aspect, anthropological aspect, that I went um, in Zambia, in Angola, at the border with the Congo, to, though Eden at that time, to live with people there, learn their language, get in the habits, to understand things of the past that are still uh, living and which have been much neglected. And then uh, to understand how writers well known like Mudimbe from the Congo and others uh, have been able to, to put such tradition in their writings and to make possible that, can, that they can share that, them with uh, the world. Yeah, now another section of my, uh, my um, learning education turned around English literature, which as I pointed out earlier, had already an introduction in high school. Then it focused, it focused on writers such as Jane Austen, Charles Dickens, George Orwell, and then I was surprised when last, last year's uh, the Americans uh, read um, uh, uh, 1984 by George Orwell's and then uh, uh, tried to read it for understanding what was happening here in the US. But I had the chance to be introduced to that when I was in high school and then, and then read it a couple of times when I was at university. Virginia Woolf, James Joyce, Emily Brunty, Joseph Conrad, and, and later on, we had uh, long discussions and writings, and Chinua Achebe especially used to discuss and condemn Joseph Conrad for his art of darkness. And then I had uh, the chance also to participate in some discussions, turning around such discussions. Geoffrey Chaucer, William Faulkner, Henry uh, James, and um, others, English writers. And then I was, I think, mature enough to get into the world. But before getting into the world, even though I pointed out earlier that I was interested in teaching, in pedagogy, so I had finally the chance to go a couple of times to Belgium, to Moss University, to Brussels University, to Louvain and Liège universities for for studying the basics, even though in many ways, with what I, I told you before, I was already into, introduced, but I learned there how to use modern equipment, modern material for teaching, for communication with students. At the same time, I discovered that even though I was learning that, the most important is what, is what I, I, I have pointed out which was how to interact with the student, how to meet him at the center of the learning, which I learned at the time when I was with Phil in class and when there, is, there, there was no internet, there was no Zoom like today, <laughs> but when the teacher had to do his best to communicate with students. So I went back to, to the University of Lubumbashi director asked me to open an office of university pedagogy. So I became the first one to start teaching teachers there how uh, to teach. 
In 2003, I came for the first time to the US and went to the University of California, Santa Barbara, because the US Embassy had selected me for learning uh, um, a, a summer class of uh, religion and pluralism. The class was explaining how um, religion is lived in the, in the United States and how we can find it in different locations in different ways and how uh, uh, people of different faith li uh, use together and sometimes um, come together in uh, political matters. That was quite important for me coming from a Congo, a country from more than 400 uh, um, languages and uh, whose people looked differently at uh, things. At the same time, while attending that class, I met friends, I met friends from Muslim countries and also a specific one from Japan. He will invite me for the next year, uh, next year that is 2005, to go to the, for the first time to um, uh, Japan, participate in a conference, in the World Conference of Religions and Literature uh, in 2005, and then start doing some research work with Nansen University. Unfortunately, when I went back to Congo, that's when I got arrested and uh, later on had to leave. And when I le left the country in 2006, I went to Harvard University, to the then called um, uh, W. Du Bois Institute, where I conducted my research on HIV, AIDS, religion, and literature uh, in Africa. It was for one year. Then I went to Peaches College, where again, the School at Risk Network had, uh, had made, had, uh, had made arrangement with the university that I could stay there for one year. Um, I taught classes related to African literature, African politics, African art, and religions. From there, I went to, to Japan in Tokyo Christian University. And later on, I spent much more time to Kyoto, in Kyoto, in the International Center for Japanese Studies, where I could compare African shamanism to, uh, with uh, African shamanism. Then in 2009, I came back to the US and was at Massachusetts College of Art and Design in liberal arts, where once again I could teach classes related to African literature, African art, African philosophy, African religion. The contract there was going up to 2012. At that level, because of what I was getting, the feedback I was getting from my friends and colleagues, which were clearly pointing out the fact that they were expecting me to give much more what was African because they had already enough of African, of American literature uh, and English literature. So such conversations decided me to take an opportunity I was given at Ghent University in Belgium, knowing well that Belgium has a lot of documentation related to the Congo and to Africa. And while there, in the first years I taught, I, and then I had uh, some research in the Netherlands at the African Studies Center, and then uh, I was, I introduced uh, a request for writing another uh, doctoral dissertation for which um, Ghent University and uh, a Brussels, a Brussels University provided me with funds for having field work in Africa uh, for a couple of years, uh, which led me to getting a double uh, doctoral diploma into anthropology and interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary studies 
in April 2017. From there, I accepted a postdoctoral position in Brazil, in Minas, where I had research on the Congado, which I was comparing with the Likumbi Liamize from Zambia festivals and study the poet, uh, poetics, uh, communication, mimesis, aesthetics, and the sacred and the profane. Uh, it is when that uh, program ended last year in October that I had the chance to come to Harvard, I mean to Fordham, where I am right now. Once again, I would like to stop here for a while for questions. I, I think it's amazing that uh, uh, here you, you taught in Japan, in South America, in uh, California, in Massachusetts, New York, Belgium, all over the world. And one of the things that really strikes me, Felix, is the fact that you, you, it seems as if your studies have evolved in, in a number of different disciplines. Uh, we started with talking about the oral tradition, then we talked about anthropology, we talked about pedagogy, African literature, obviously uh, British literature. And it's a very eclectic uh, background and an international and global profile. Uh, and I'm just wondering, uh, what's next, Felix? What, 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 what's good? How, how do we, what, what, what will we uh, hear next? What, what new endeavor will you be taking yeah. on? That's a very good qu question. What is next? What is next? I wish I could, um, I could be in a place where I would have a longer program with students and where I could develop a program linking students from the North, the US and Europe, and some students from the South, Brazil and Africa on uh, programs related to general knowledge, to literature, and uh, to, to planning the future. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be possible at this level because I've still to stick to a short uh, contract I have uh, um, at uh, Fordham, which doesn't doesn't tell me exactly what would happen after. But all the same, I can say that the future will be in many ways the same, focusing on the evolution of global literature. For instance, I have had discussions uh, this year, uh, just before uh, summer break with uh, Fordham colleagues via Zoom who were uh, reading the book um, th th that professors teaching biblical literature. And uh, we were discussing the book of Job. It was so interesting to, to see that my own understanding and interpretation from African perspective could be so different from my other colleagues, but at the same time, so rich to share with them. So these are kind of things I wish I could continue doing in literature and in other fields with uh, colleagues. I wish, then, the, the, you know, leaving my country was a sad thing, but finally it has its own positive sides. Let's just take one last example. I found myself here in New York when the pandemic started. And uh, I was, and I am alone by myself. So that was somehow difficult to face. But at the same time, it became resourceful to use that time and decide to go back to the material I had in class with you, for instance, and review how a sonnet is, is written, how a good uh, poem is written, and then to decide that each single day of the pandemic, I will be writing, I will be drafting a poem 
related to my feelings, related to my observation through the window, the windows, related to my observation of the, the, the apartment, for instance, the shoes that I, I used to put on for going to fold them that are there now, I, can, I, no longer, I don't need them while being inside, or the chairs that are there, and the communication that I could have with this material. So that became a rich and interesting program for me, and the chance to have that capacity to look at things differently because of this isolation in a place that is mostly crowded uh, with, uh, uh, with people. So, so in the same way, my journey seemed to be mixing so many things. I'm sure it shows clearly that whenever there is a purpose, whenever there is something new to discuss, whenever there is something to clarify, I will jump in and will use some of my background um, uh, wealth um, uh, to, to put in, understand it, and exchange with students, friends, and some other people around the world. Yeah. I don't mean to put you on the spot, Felix, but I wonder, could you share a poem with us? Yes, I would be happy to do that. Yeah. Though, um, that is in the drafting, <laughs> drafting conditions. Yeah, but I'll be happy to, to share that uh, in a couple of weeks. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, send that and I'll, I'll put yeah. that on the yeah. agenda. That'll be great. While I was um, um, in Brazil, apart from writing, apart from searching on uh, the festivals, the Congado and the oral traditions and the survival of African traditions uh, into Brazil, I was writing, I was drafting a, a, a novel which has as title Lula do Brasil, Lula uh, from Brazil, but adapted to the reality of the Congo, where I had heard a couple of years ago, while President Lula was in power, that some Congolese um, politicians were saying, give us the power, and in five years, the Congo would change and become like Brazil. So um, with that, I come into a given dialogue showing how politicians um, can, can promise a lot of things, but actually can en end up doing nothing and then blaming others. Uh, so that also is almost at the end. And uh, I will be... Uh, um, giving a draft to a friend who has volunteered to review it. And then after that, um, I will be trying to get it uh, published. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Um, Felix, I, 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 one of the aspects of your career has been uh, political consciousness, activism, and you have witnessed uh, and experienced uh, great hardship uh, on account of, of political unrest. And here we find ourselves in the United States in the midst of this crisis of race relations and uh, this, what, what we all hope will be a kind of revolution. Um, I wonder if, if we could hear your perspective on current events having to do with uh, the, the police brutality and overall American oppression as you've experienced it and witnessed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. You know, I saw it arriving. I wouldn't tell exactly when that would, would happen. But uh, during the class I had last semester with students, the, we, we were two. It, 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 it is a class we're co-teaching. Uh, it turned around framing writing and then presenting the events to the public. And we selected writers from a, a, around the world who had undergone hardships in their countries had to live or were in prison, etc. Many times students in my class said, but that's not at all different from what we know here. Which to me meant that they understood 
that uh, things had to change, that they understood that uh, the US could claim around the world to be a superpower, to be the first democracy of the world, but inside it, its walls, bad things were happening. So I was very happy that such ideas were coming out of younger generations. And today, when we look on the roads, those who are marching, those who are protesting, most of them are very young. So I could predict that, I could feel that, and I'm sure that whoever would like to, to govern, to lead this country in the future, will have to take that into account, to take that uh, the, the young people have a different vision of the world and they wouldn't like to inherit things that were done in a distant uh, historical past. Yeah. Dr. Felix Caputo, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been 40 years of a journey that you have uh, become a renowned international presence. And uh, we're all just delighted to have you here today. Uh, Exante sana, Felix. Asante, Asante sana. Thank you so much. And as you know, I'm still around. Whenever you need, you need me, I'll be happy to have another conversation with you or with, with some other people. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have known you as a very young uh, Peace Corps volunteer, teaching, uh, um, reciting Shakespeare in front of me, and to meet you today, still the same uh, person, able and listening and uh, conducting this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Felix.